Explicit content is found in this episode, so listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to the True Crime Fan Club Podcast. I'm your host, Lainey. Losing a loved one to murder is perhaps one of the most traumatic things a family can imagine. That trauma is further compounded when the death comes at the hands of someone the victim knew and loved, someone they trusted. Perhaps the most unimaginable of all is a murder committed against a mother by her son, her own flesh and blood. Today we'll discuss the tragic death of Diane Michelle and how even though her son Christopher Dankovich brutally cut her life short, their family still found the compassion within their hearts to forgive him. The family did this knowing that kindness is what Diane herself would have wanted and they did their best to pull together and honor her death with love and forgiveness. Okay, on to the show. Chris's mom, Diane, was steadily becoming concerned about her son. She recently found several internet searches on Chris's computer that gave her pause. From pornography to weapon making, the websites weren't like her mild-mannered son. But the searches were becoming more frequent, and as a result, so did Diane's worry. Further deepening her very justified concerns, Diane also found a PVC pipe filled with marbles and gunpowder. Her son had constructed a homemade firearm. She removed the gun and gave it to her ex-husband James, who was Chris's dad. In addition to the significant behavior changes, Chris and Diane started arguing more, specifically about his computer use and his girlfriend. Living with his mom in Rochester Hills, Michigan, Chris was becoming more erratic in his behaviors, and he seemed to consider her interference as going too far. He had recently dyed his hair blue, and despite never having been in trouble before, he was caught at a church school rattling the chain doors a mere day before the murder. Chris was staying with his dad on that Saturday, as was the norm, when he cut through the screen in the bedroom window, climbed out on a rope made of clothing he tied together, and rode his bike to the Bloomfield Hills Church. It was there that Chris was ultimately caught by police who thought he might have been a runaway. He didn't get into significant trouble, and the police officer just drove him back to his dad's. Frankly, it was extremely out of character for Chris, who was usually very laid back. The Monday following his run-in with the police at the church, James wasn't able to get in contact with his ex-wife, whom he wanted to reach to discuss their son. Because she usually answered, he was worried right away, and while he probably never thought his own son could have harmed his mom, James did think something was amiss, so he called Diane's mother to run over to the house and check on her. Meanwhile, the arguing between Diane and Chris wasn't easing up. Instead, it was escalating, so much so that on Sunday, April 24th, 2005, Chris stabbed Diane with a small knife 111 times. The murder happened inside their home, located near Teenkin and Adams Roads. Diane Michelle was 50 years old when her son stabbed her to death. She was found the next morning on April 25th by her mother, who came over to check on her at her former son-in-law's request. After noting that Diane's van wasn't there, she entered the house, finding her daughter in the entryway, in a manner that no parent should ever have to see their child. Diane was stabbed repeatedly and everywhere, including her head, face, eyes, chest, heart, and back. She further suffered from blunt force trauma to her head. Chris had partly covered Diane with a tarp, and this would be the very last image that her mother would have of Diane when she found her at 8 o'clock a.m. on that fateful morning. Diane's mom called the police and the investigation was immediately underway. She told the police that her daughter and grandson had been arguing a lot recently, and she expressed concern at what he may have done. There was plenty of evidence left behind at the scene, including bloody clothes, a blue folding knife with blood on it, and drops of blood throughout the house and in the sinks. Because both Diane's van and Chris were missing from the home, the police wanted to find and talk to him right away. After being informed about the family's cabin, 
Oakland County Sheriff Mike Bouchard contacted Richfield Township Police and asked for assistance. Police Chief Bradley Bannon sent officers to check out the cabin and located Diane's van right away. Chris did run after the killing to his dad's family cabin nearly 100 miles north in northern Michigan. The police found Chris in St. Helen, Michigan, which is in Rose Common County. St. Helen is a small, unincorporated community located within Richfield Township. As of the 2010 census, the population was under 3,000 people, which would make it incredibly easy to find the family cabin and subsequently Chris. He was found the following morning at the cabin with full survival gear. After watching Chris for around three hours, he exited the cabin, surrendered himself to police, and was arrested without incident. He had shaved his head and was in full military gear. He admitted to his mother's murder at once, telling police he knew why they were there. He planned to head south and go underground for a time to wait for everything to blow over. Christopher Dankovich was charged with open murder as an adult. If he was convicted of first or even second degree murder, he could face life imprisonment. He was held in a juvenile detention center without bail pending a trial or a plea deal. Several friends and family members of both him and his mother appeared in support of Chris, which his attorney noted to the judge. But despite the love and support that was still being shown to Chris, the bond was denied. His lawyer couldn't make sense of his client or the heinous crime. It simply didn't add up that this small-framed, almost frail-looking teenager could viciously stab his mother over and over, slowly killing her. Chris's attorney, Mitchell Ribwitter, advised the court that he would probably be seeking a psychiatric evaluation for his client, noting his lack of any type of record or even trouble at school. Ribwitter further indicated that he would probably be advising Chris to plead not guilty by reason of insanity. Both the prosecution and the defense were eager to resolve the case without a trial. No one wanted this poor family to have to endure lengthy court hearings. Prosecutors spoke to Diane's mother, and she favored plea negotiations, indicating that she had forgiven her grandson and she only wanted to move forward as best as one could in her situation. There was initially a preliminary examination scheduled, but both sides hoped to avoid more hearings than necessary. On November 15, 2005, Chris made a court appearance, waiving his right to a preliminary examination. Typically, defendants in Michigan will waive this evidentiary hearing to continue plea negotiations with the prosecution. Because, in this case, both the prosecutors and Chris's defense team wanted to resolve the matter. There was no need to hold the hearing, but it still had to be formally waived on the court's record. The next legal step was a circuit court arraignment, which for Chris was about a month after his prelim waiver. There were at least a few attempts to resolve the case with the sentencing deal. The first attempt was a sentencing agreement both the defense and prosecution created for Chris. The agreement said that he would be sentenced to 22 and a half years minimum. On March 13, 2006, the parties appeared in court for the plea, but the judge wasn't content with this negotiated offer and therefore he was unwilling to accept the plea and sentencing agreement. Judge McDonald simply couldn't go along with what he felt was too lenient of a sentence, and he said as much in court saying, quote, he felt a responsibility to society. Another plea agreement was finally reached when both sides were able to appease Oakland County Circuit Court Judge John J. McDonald. The judge explained that he was as, quote, satisfied as he could be, having reviewed several attempted resolutions. Chris's defense attorney, Mitchell Ribwitter, said that Chris was the one who wanted to plead guilty to open murder, which allows the jury or sentencing judge to convict and sentence a defendant to first, second, or third-degree murder, or even the lesser manslaughter charge. The judge found Chris guilty of second-degree murder, which is not accidental but not premeditated. The defense team believed that Chris had a legitimate claim of not guilty by reason of insanity. Still, and ultimately, they maintained that Chris wanted to accept responsibility for his atrocious act. The prosecution believed that they, in turn, had an excellent case against Chris and thought they could justify a first-degree murder charge. 
If Chris were found guilty of first-degree murder, he would face a minimum life in prison without parole sentence, as per the Michigan Minimum Sentencing Guidelines. Assistant Prosecutor Lisa Ortlieb Gorsaika prosecuted the case against Christopher Dankovich. Chris was sentenced on May 2, 2006, to a minimum of 25 years, to a maximum of 37 and a half years in prison. Chris will be at least 40 years old when he becomes eligible for parole. He apologized, saying he isn't a violent person. The judge questioned him during the sentencing, but Chris stood acquiescent, accepting his punishment. Chris had no words of significance to offer as to how he felt or why he did what he did, leaving the judge somewhat baffled. A psychologist testified before the sentencing, and it was stated that Chris was believed to be delusional, discussing how Chris told him that he thought he was on a mission from God to protect children from pedophiles, pornography, and abortion. His mother didn't believe him, which meant she stood in his way. So he felt that he had to stop her, which meant killing her. His mission, he believed, was much more important than his or his mother's life. He said he felt terrible and things didn't go as planned, but he also couldn't stop himself. The defense tried to claim in a written letter to the judge that Diane was abusive to Chris, but the judge wasn't buying it. The message was noted in court, although he kept the writer confidential during the proceedings. Judge McDonald couldn't grasp just how or why this crime happened. Chris wasn't a typical criminal, and this entire situation was utterly atypical. This young man was a model citizen, a perfect student, and yet he committed such a horrific, violent crime. It was unimaginable from where he even got such ideas. Chris appeared to be the kind of kid that wouldn't ever commit such an awful crime, Heck, he didn't even seem to be the kind of kid that would even commit petty theft. The whole thing was just outlandish to anyone on the outside looking in. Chris's defense attorney told the judge that he thoroughly explained prison to his client, including what to expect. Although his attorney thought Chris understood him, he admitted that he couldn't predict what kind of man Chris might be when he was finally released. He further acknowledged that while Diane knew Chris was making weapons, she probably didn't understand what his motivation was, and though this part was not admitted, it can be assumed that the lack of understanding was the very key to preventing this horrific crime. For Diane could have never known without Chris's reasoned explanation what was troubling him, such as abortions and child molesters. Had this poor woman known what indeed weighed on her son, she would have sought to aid him in any treatment possible. Chris appeared to suffer from genuine mental illness, one that caused him to believe, beyond all doubt, that he was meant to be a vigilante or a savior to children that were harmed by adults, molested and beaten by the evil people. He thought this was his mission in life and should anyone stand in his way, whether that was his mother or one of the evil people themselves, He must stand steadfast in his duty to protect and serve these imaginary children that he thought to be at risk. And make no mistake, Chris's fears are realized every single day, as we all know, much too well. But in this case, there was no specific or actual children that Chris was sent to protect. It was because of all these reasons, his attorney claimed, that Chris had cause for an insanity claim in the criminal justice system. It was his own fears in his own head that had gotten the best of him. I'm going to pause the case right here so you can hear a word from our sponsors. Medterra is one of the leading CBD brands in the industry with a full line of functional CBD products. Staying healthy nowadays means watching your overall well-being, sleep, stress, and your overall health. You should prioritize easy ways to boost your immunity. And Medterra is legal in all 50 states and you won't get high. It's basically everything you need for daily immune support in one convenient bottle to keep you protected all day long, no matter where you are. In the past, I've always thought of immunity products as something that you take once you start to feel run down. But being proactive about it is so important right now. 
They sent me some of it a few weeks ago, and I've been using it as part of my daily routine. I feel more refreshed, less groggy, and have better mental clarity. I love that it has a great taste and their dedication to quality, and especially that they have zero THC. I was skeptical of CBD products before, and I think this product could be good for anyone who's really needing that immune boost. Mentera was developed with leading immunologists and medical doctors. It's a natural combination of CBD, vitamin C, elderberry, echinacea, and ginger root, all scientifically proven to boost your immunity, in addition to Medterra's high-quality CBD extract. So if you want to give it a try, visit medterracbd.com and enter code TCFC at checkout to receive 20% off. That's M-E-D-T-E-R-R-A-C-B-D dot com and enter code TCFC at checkout to receive 20% off. At ModCloth, they make getting dressed fun. Back to being independently owned, they're all about perfect fits for every body. Unique, mood-boosting prints, vintage-inspired, versatile styles that make you look good, but more importantly, feel good. You can find your joy at ModCloth. A couple of years ago, I got married to my very best friend, my husband, Brett, and I bought my wedding dress off Mod Cloth. I was searching Pinterest and I was definitely on a budget. And the Mod Cloth wedding dress kept coming up and it was so beautiful with its vintage style and its wide skirt that I just had to get it. So I got it along with some shoes and it made my pictures look so great. I've never felt more beautiful than when I was in my wedding dress. And of course, I love Mod Cloth's website in general because they have a bunch of fun prints, so I always look and see if I can find another cute dress to wear when I get to go back into the office. And I always look for another fun dress that I can just wear around. So if you want to be like me and shop on Mod Cloth, do you get 20% off your purchase of $75 or more, including sales item? Go to modcloth.com and enter code TCFC at checkout. Promo code cannot be combined with other offers. Again, that's modcloth.com and enter code TCFC for 20% off your order of $75 or more. Despite this, the judge continued to question Chris. Just to be confident he understood his crime and his punishment, the sheer gravity of everything that stood before him. The judge decided that he did think Chris understood and proceeded to sentence. Chris was held with other juvenile criminals in prison. However, he was moved to the general population area after he turned 21 years old. He currently resides in the Thumb Correctional Facility in Lapeer, Michigan. The earliest possible date Chris could be released is in 2030. However, his maximum discharge date is April 24, 2042. No matter whether he is paroled or not, Christopher Dinkovich will eventually be free from prison at 52 years old. In 2016, Chris contributed an article to The Marshall Project, a nonprofit organization that offers online journalism, which covers criminal justice issues. His essay was written in 2006 and published a decade later. His writings are disturbingly eloquent. After being sentenced, he described being placed in what he referred to as the pole, which was mainly a holding cell to keep newly sentenced inmates from harming themselves. Chris wrote, quote, I begin to wonder whether it got its name because it was where they put people who were crazy, or whether it's because this was a place they put people to make them go crazy. Was there even a distinction? And another insightful quote taken from the same Marshall Project article he wrote, quote, Try to imagine being 15 years old and being told that you, your brain, and your conception of reality and everything you knew was wrong. There I was, so crazy, I wouldn't plead crazy. Chris made a feeble attempt to describe abuse growing up in his home, although there had never previously been any claims or evidence of such. No one described Diane Michelle as anything but loving and kind. Born to parents Elaine and Nick Palmer, Diane met and married James Dinkovich on May 20th, 1989. They lived in Rochester, Michigan, and together they had a son named Christopher, who was born on October 23rd, 1989. 
James and Diane's marriage lasted a little over six years when the couple divorced in August 1995. Court documents show that Diane alleged verbal and physical abuse, but her divorce attorney recalls the couple as being amicable. Once the divorce was final, Diane began using the maiden name O'Connor, but she soon changed her last name to Michelle. Unfortunately, the research didn't provide any reason why she chose a different last name. She was awarded custody of Chris, but allowed his dad regular visitation. Diane worked as a psychologist at the Heartlight Metaphysical Center in Birmingham, Michigan. She ran the center as she held a master's degree in counseling, and she was also a certified hypnotherapist, and also held the titles of a social worker and minister in her career. Diane's passion was helping others, which she did with such grace and love. Her care for humanity was on full display, as evidenced by the vanity license plate on her Chevy Astro van, which read, Love for You. The entire community was shocked by Diane's death. She was so beloved. Not only that, but the town also had to deal with losing Christopher, who was never the kind of young man anyone could imagine committing such a horrific act. In addition to her parents, Diane left behind a brother, Dean, and sister-in-law, Susan. James Dankovich continues to forge a relationship with his son through the Michigan Department of Corrections prison system. He recalls the hard parts of having a child that is in prison and his contribution to the PrisonWriters.com forum. James is a contributing writer for the online space and finds some solace in talking about his sons and other lives in prison including what he believes is a severe need for reform. Some of the conditions he writes about includes family members being turned away from visitation because of dress code violations, embarrassing searches, and long waits to see his son. James describes prisoners as having poor health care and even more inadequate diets. His concern is palpable as he details the overcrowding, insane rates for telephone calls, and increasingly treacherous conditions. He talks of the lack of familial or any kind of support, estimating that almost 80% of inmates don't get visits of any kind by anyone. But perhaps what James feels is the saddest is knowing that some children who are locked up are considered unable to change and therefore disposable, like animals who cannot be redeemed. James was in court when Judge McDonald spoke directly to him, saying, quote, It's a very tragic case and my heart goes out to you and your other family members. James Dinkovich paid a high price in this horrific story. He lost his ex-wife in a ruthless manner and nearly his son. And maybe that is why forgiveness for his son's terrible act came quickly to James, so he needn't have lost anything else precious and dear to him. Okay, fan club members, as I conclude this episode, my one question to you is, how will you sleep tonight? Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a positive review and rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcast player of choice. It really does help. You can find us on most social media channels, Twitter at TCFC Pod, Facebook.com slash TCFC Podcast, Instagram at True Crime Fan Club Pod, and of course our website is truecrimefanclub.com. If you have an episode request, send us an email, tcfcpod at gmail.com. This episode was written by Mary Cole, researched and edited by Brittany Martinez. <laughs>